Hello, good morning. Can you all hear me? All right. You can. Awesome. Cool. Hello from Wellington in New Zealand. It's 8 p.m. here, like 20 hundred. And I just wanted to quickly show my face so that you believe that I'm actually a real person doing this live and not pre-recorded. This is my little office and I'm switching into screen sharing mode. Um, and then we'll start with the talk. Cool. And now you should see my title slide. I would hope you do. Let me know if that is, for whatever reason, not the case. I'm having the chat open and monitor that. Cool. So this is a bit of a different session, right? Like um, it's not your typical Android or mobile related talk. The idea of this session is to talk a little bit about mathematics for developers and also about um, ways to bring people back to mathematics. Because I think that a lot of people who do software development have had some touch points with math in the, in the past, but for whatever reason, quite a few developers lose those touch points. And that's, um, actually it's a bit sad because mathematics is kind of such an interesting field and I would want more people to pick that up. When you think about how you know, people used to come to the industry, to the IT industry, you'll find that 20 or 30 years ago, the classic path would be a degree in computer science or in math or in physics or any kind of you know, science related field. And then you would end up with a software developer job somewhere. But nowadays that has changed quite a bit. So we have lots of developers coming from other walks of life, like people who are self-educated, who never went to university, for example, people who trained as something completely different and then decided I want to be a developer and I go through some sort of a bootcamp program or cross train from any other profession. And I don't think that mathematics is a requirement to be a good software developer, but there are lots of areas in our day-to-day -day work that use math to some degree, you know, and we'll cover some of them during this talk. And I just want to point out a few ways to get back to this kind of part of software development or even, you know, learn it from scratch. So what was the motivation for this session? Um, so myself, I'm a software engineer and I studied math at university. So I did a um, master's degree in mathematics and becoming a software engineer was kind of a bit of an afterthought in some way. I grew up in Germany, um, went through high school and uni in Germany. And then at some point after uni moved to New Zealand where I still live. And when you go to high school in Germany, um, for a start, it takes about 13 years or 12 in some states. But math is one of the subjects that comes along with you pretty much all the time. And high school math, in Germany at least, is very much about applying mathematics. So you calculate things. You know, you have a particular task or challenge and you have to come up with a result. And then I liked that and I enjoyed mathematics in school. So I went to uni and started my degree and all of a sudden it was totally different because all of a sudden you had to prove things and you had to, you know, deal with theorems and conclusions and proofs and you wouldn't apply mathematics anymore. And I totally lost the interest in that to some extent, um, finished the degree, then got into software development and mainly around web development that time. And I didn't use my degree a lot until machine learning came around, funny enough. So at some point, a few years ago, I got interested in machine learning and um, took the original machine learning MOOC at Coursera. And all of a sudden, when I was doing that, I realized how much mathematics is part of machine learning. And at the same time, I found that the mathematics involved in that MOOC came really easy to me. 
And that was clearly because I have a background in mathematics. What I didn't really realize until a while into going back to those those skills and, 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 and tasks was that a lot of my friends who maybe haven't gone through that level of formal education actually struggled with the mathematics in machine learning and in this MOOC or in similar MOOCs because you deal with like, you know, regression and huge matrices and like you have to derive and build formulas to calculate things in the examples. And it came very natural to me, but for a lot of people it didn't. So you start to wonder like why that is, right? And like um, why some people like mathematics and why it comes natural to some people, but also why math is useful for our profession for software development in general. And I believe there are like three main elements why everyone who does software development should at least have a look at math. Um, the first one is, it's a very, very nice tool to help you solve abstract problems. So, I mean, here's a simple one on that slide. It's kind of like, you know, children's game, you have to move a little tower of disks in different sizes from one pile to the other. And you can always stack like smaller disks on top of larger disks. And there are algorithms for that. But at the end of the day, that's an, an abstract problem. And mathematics is about nothing else but solving abstract problems. So from that point of view, I think um, it is very, very useful to deal with a mathematics degree or problems of mathematics to train and improve your general problem solving abilities. Because realistically, a mathematics degree in uni, at least in Germany where I did it, doesn't teach you a lot of practical skills, to be honest. It's very much an academic course that is supposed to prepare you for a PhD or a doctorate and then onwards towards you know, becoming a lecturer or professor. The reality is most people like me don't go down that path. They, you know, stop after a bachelor or master's degree and go into the industry. But from a training mindset and from a content mind that mindset, that is exactly what the degree is still about. So the next more practical application is use of mathematics in development. And when we think about topics like animations, transitions, Lambda calculus, logic, stuff like big data or machine learning, they all have various elements of mathematics involved in the respective subject. And while you can do machine learning fine without knowing anything about the math behind it, using libraries and frameworks and platforms and services, it is kind of nice to know at least a few things. Um, about what you're actually doing. And the third big pillar is fun. You know, math is fun and beautiful. Here we see like um, a typical Mandelbrot fractal, which is derived from math. And what I'm doing every year is I have one of these mathematic challenges calendars. So it's a little math challenge per day. And, you know, you can do it on the day, or you can, you know, maybe do all of them from a week on the weekend. And they usually don't take long. They are, you know, sometimes they take a minute, sometimes they take 10 minutes, but it's not a massive thing, but it keeps you kind of involved with the way of thinking and the way of dealing with mathematics. And I like that quite a lot. So last year I did around 310 of the 365 for the year. And I still have a pile of shame of like 50-ish tasks and challenges left that I haven't done yet that are my kind of backlog, unfortunately. This slide here shows a beautiful visualization of mathematics or different fields of mathematics. It's called the map of mathematics. And it's from a gentleman 
called Dominic Valleyman. He has a YouTube channel um, called Domain of Science, where he teaches all sorts of things around mathematics and physics and science in general. And I found this map really compelling because it starts with that big brown area in the middle, the origins of mathematics, which are basically counting. And then it derives into certain areas outside of these origins to you know, explore different things you can do with mathematics. And we'll come back to that map later. I just wanna point out, um, you can actually buy this map as a massive poster um, on Redbubble. You know, just put the link in here. I have no financial interest in that, but I think it's so beautiful. You know, nearly everyone should buy one of these posters and put it up on their wall. It's really, really cool. Okay, let's get started and talk about traditional schooling of mathematics. So if you go to through primary school in, um, in Germany, you would basically do stuff like dealing with numbers and you learn counting and you learn arithmetic, like addition and subtraction and later multiplication and division um, gets added to that. You do stuff like basic geometry, you know, you draw things, you draw lines and intersection of lines and stuff like that. And then you come into high school, usually in year five, when you're like 10 or 11 years old. And what changes is you do arithmetic with larger numbers and you maybe deal with different number systems like Roman and dual um, numbers. You get into algebra, which is like solving equations with unknowns. You do a bit more ge geometry and you learn trigonometry, which is basically ge geometry for triangles. And you might get across some basics in probability calculations and statistics. And then after year 10, 11, when you go into the last two or three years of high school, you do things like calculus, linear algebra, and more geometry, and usually a special course on statistics and probabilities. These are the three like main pillars in, in high school math in, in Germany. So for a start, what's calculus? Calculus is the field where you look at functions rate of change and stuff like limits and convergence. So for example, you might have a function like here, um, f with x as a variable. That's the kind of greenish line on that slide. And you have a purple line, which is a secant. So it intersects this function in um, two points. And what that kind of tries to show here is you can use that secant to approximate the incline of the function in a certain area. That's just one of the more simple problems you would, would deal with in calculus. But in general, calculus is the, the mathematical field where you deal with functions and you calculate troughs and peaks and like inclines and declines and all sorts of things. And then we have linear algebra. And linear algebra is usually represented by something like this, which is like, you know, dealing with vectors in a space. And for, for the beginning, that's usually a two dimensional space. And later it might be a three dimensional space, or it might be an N dimensional space because the only limitation that two or three dimensions really introduces is that we can imagine what a two or three dimensional space is for the math behind it doesn't really make much difference. So this example here shows the addition of two vectors or the subtraction rather. And then the third big pillar in high school math is statistics and probability, which you know you might know from distribution curves. Here we've got sort of like different variations of a normal distribution. This is like a random variable that be behaves like a normal distribution. So you have lots of the random events happening kind of in the middle of your distribution and then less and less towards the outside and the outliers of your distribution. So where would you go from here, right? Like let's make the assumption that 
you had some basic math schooling. Let's say you went through at least 10 years of schooling and you know the basics of mathematics. Now you're a software developer, however you got there, don't really care, but you wanna you know, look into whatever field interests you and understand the math behind it. And what I find to be the best way is pick a goal or define a goal and then unpack that goal and try to see what happens behind the scenes of that goal. Just work backwards from that goal. And to give you an example, let's say you want to understand how animation works and you want to rotate something in 2D or 3D. That's kind of your, your end goal, your end game, let's say. So how would you go about that? And I think the easiest way to get started is to break it down into topics. So the topics for you know this animation and rotation goal would be, okay, I let's say I go to Google and I search for how do I rotate something? And it starts to talk about vectors and matrices, and it starts to talk about trigonom trigonometric functions. So cool, I've got two topics. How do I get going with that? And let's have a look what you find with some initial research on vectors and matrices and on those functions. A really nice definition of rotation is the turning of an object or coordinate system by an angle about a fixed point. So you have a fixed point and then you say, I wanna rotate something, let's say 30 degrees or 90 degrees or 180 degrees. Rotations can be implemented using rotation matrices. Cool. Let's have a look what matrices are and what vectors are. So here we've got a coordinate system um, with an X and a Y axis. The X axis goes from left to right. The Y axis goes from bottom to top. And our point A sits in the middle of that coordinate system in zero, zero. That's kind of the, the, you know, the default or the source of this coordinate system. And our point B um, sits at the coordinates for five and six, which is up here. So the arrow between A and B can be expressed as a vector with the coordinates five and six. If I want to go from A to B, I have to go five along the X axis and then six up the Y axis, five, six. And that's so easy because one of the points is kind of zero, zero. So we don't have to do much here. But let's have a look at this point here or this vector here. C is has the coordinates seven on X and three on Y. D has 12 on X and two on Y. So if I wanna move from C to D, I have to move five units along the X axis and minus one because I'm going down along the Y axis. So the, ve the vector describing this transition is five and minus one. So that's the very basic fundamental way to look at what a vector is. It's a the description of a movement of a direction of a transition. Now in that definition earlier, we saw rotation matrix being mentioned. And I just made it easy and I put a rotation matrix up here. So when you compare that with a vector, you'll see that this looks pretty much like two vectors in one big set of parentheses. So we have like zero minus one and one zero. And it kind of is like something like two vectors. But the idea is if you have a point or a vector to a point and you have a rotation matrix, you can transform that vector into a rotated vector. So in this case here, this rotation matrix has a visual representation of moving the gray R 
into the red R. So we're not defining you know, the character R here. We are defining the rotation. So in a nutshell, this is actually a rotation of 90 degrees counterclockwise. And at this stage, you have to believe me that that is the case. Let's have a look at our vector, you know, that AB vector with the um, values of five, six. I take our rotation matrix and I multiply the vector against that from the right. And the way how you multiply vectors with a matrix in this case is you take the first row of the matrix and you multiply it element by element with the vector. So I have zero times five and minus one times six. And the result is minus six. And then I multiply the second row of my matrix with the vector. So I get one times five plus zero times six gives me five. And indeed the vector minus six, five, our result from the calculation means I go six to the left along the x-axis. Then I go five up and this is a vector from A to E now. And when you just look at this setup here, it becomes very obvious visually that we have rotated our original vector exactly 90 degrees to the left or counterclockwise. And that's how you do a rotation in you know, two dimensional space. It's on the surface, very simple. Obviously there are some tricks included here, right? And some, you know, magic. So for a start, the rotation matrix I showed you was only for a specific use case. And the use case was like, go 90 degrees counterclockwise. But it illustrates the idea of matrix multi multiplication, which is a very important concept in general to um, understand for a lot of things in mathematics. This is the real definition of a rotation matrix. Um, what you can see here is the R matrix has cosinus and sinus of an angle in here. So the, the, the reason why in our matrix that was so nice with zero and minus ones and ones and zeros was that we chose 90 degrees. But the reality is you can do this with any angle. If I want to have like, you know, a rotation of 37.24 degrees, which you might need in some application, for example, a game or something like that, then you just like calculate the cosine and the sine of that particular angle and put it into your rotation matrix. Now you look at that and you think probably like, why would a rotation matrix in general have sine and cosine in there in the first place? And the reason is that as soon as we deal with angles, those trigonomic, trigonometric functions usually play a big role. And I can't really go into all the details and explain like why that matrix has to look exactly like that, but that's part of that exploration element you want to get into, right? If you want to understand rotation in two-dimensional and three-dimensional space, that's what you want to explore. Just give you a quick hint into the um, sine and cosine functions. They are what's called like oscillating functions. Um, so th the sine function, which is the red line here, starts at zero and then goes up to um, a point that is actually one and a half times pi. So pi, let's say, is 3.14. So this point would roughly be around um, 1.57, which visually kind of works out. And then it goes down again to pi, goes further down to three times pi by two, and then comes back to two times pi. And for again, reasons that don't really fit into the time frame of this talk, those numbers 
you have along the x-axis match with visual angles in geometry. So 2 times pi is 360, pi is 180. And again, that feeds into like, all right, so why is that? Let's try to explore that as the next step and dive deeper into these mathematical problems step by step. But what this is supposed to show um, on the slide here is mainly that there is a relationship between, you know, trigonometry and rotation matrices and sinus and cosine and all these kind of functions. They play a quite heavy and important role as well. So how do we get to finding that knowledge? And we'll get back to that a bit later. Um, but what you find and what, you know, is kind of really astonishing when you think about it, it turns out that when you look at mathematics, you pretty much look at a system of building blocks. So what we're trying to you know, deal with might be that blue building block up here right now, but it has a whole lot of other building blocks below it. And to fully understand what is going on, we need to know more about those building blocks below our current one usually. And that can be tricky, right? Because it can be one of those rabbit holes where you go down a path and all of a sudden you're like, oh my God, I need to actually go to uni and spend 10 years studying math to fully understand that. And that happens sometimes, but it's then about like finding the right cutoff point and finding that point where you say like, right, I wanna understand this, but really I wanna understand it only to a level that I can better use it for my purpose. I don't have to go back to, you know, the basics and prove everything. I'm fine with just learning about the applications. And that's a balancing act sometimes, unfortunately. So let's go back to our goal. We said we want to understand how animation works and how to rotate something in 2 or 3D. Cool. So we've done that. We looked at the topics and the topics were vectors and matrices and trigonomic functions. If we actually look at what we need to learn a bit closer, it's more than that. It's specifically like things like matrices in 2 and 3D, vectors and their geometric representation. You need to know some basics about geometry, some basics about algebra, and you need to know some calculus. And what I've been trying to do when I was actually preparing this talk, trying to find the actual bits that you need to know in each subject. So for matrices, for example, you need to know how to solve linear equations and you need to know like what the Gauss algorithm is. It's basically some way to solve equations with matrices and you need to know a whole bunch of notations. And for vectors, it's kind of similar, right? You need to know what a vector means geometrically and how you calculate and how you do, you know, math with vectors. In geometry, you need to know basics about points and lines, planes and spaces, shapes like triangle and rectangle, at least some basics, you know, they shouldn't be unfamiliar. Then we have some algebra, uh, algebra basics. There are variables and placeholders and equations and how you rearrange equations so that you can solve them. And then there's finally some calculus around functions and particularly those trigonomic, trigonometric functions, sine, cosine, and, and tangents. You don't need to be a master in all of these things, but you will come across terminology as part of your, of, of your, as part of your discovery. And you will need to at least know roughly what they mean, you know, you need to know what a point is and what a line is to a point. Or you need to know that when you see an equation with something equals 27 X, how you can isolate the X. And if you don't know that yet, that's just another building block you need to unpack, unfortunately. Let's have a look at another of these goals. I prepared a few. So in this one, we want to learn visual animation again, but now we want to look at 2D movement with, you know, stuff like acceleration and speed control and easing into an animation and easing out of an animation, those kind of things. And again, we break it down into topics and on a 
high level, this is again vectors and matrices, functions and calculus, and some physical mathematics about movement and speed and stuff like that. I'll show you a quick video or some videos. I hope that actually works. Yeah. And you see some examples here of what I mean with these um, accelerations. Here we have like little bars that get acceler accelerated by that function. So the first one is just like a function to the power of two. So it gets a little bit faster towards the end of the animation, but the bottom one is to the power of five. And that gets, that got really, really fast when, when we went through it. This video shows a, what's called a bow animation. So it pulls back a little bit before it shoots off. Like you would pull like in a bow and arrow shooting situation. And again, you see like the function for that is something that is very typical to what you would look at in calculus. And even when you look at the function definition up here, it has something with like the power of two plus some linear element to that. Um, calculus is, you know, really useful for these kind of setups. And the third one is a bit of a crazy oscillating one. But you see it like bumping up and down and then making a big jump eventually. Again, like in the previous examples, we see this is a function. There's a mathematical way to describe that function and that has even cosine and pi and stuff in here. Um, and if you really wanna build those custom animations, you need to know something about math to achieve your desired effect. And breaking this down in the same way as we've done before, we have a whole bunch of topics again. We have matrices in 2D with you know, linear equations and Gauss algorithm and blah, blah, blah. So we don't need 3D for this. Then we have vectors and geometric representations. We have calculus with the sine, cosine, and tangents. We have physical mathematics, where we actually look at the physical implement, uh, the physical effects of functions like approximations to curves, splines, which are functions that are put together by individual bits. And we look at numerical mathematics where we simulate things. And what should hopefully become obvious is like the first three things we've seen before. So clearly, if you learn about matrices and vectors and calculus, that helps you with two things that have an actual direct application for software development in some way. Let's have a look at AI and machine learning. So you wanna understand more about data analysis or the basics of AI and machine learning. Topics that you would wanna deal with, matrices, surprise, surprise, algebra, and statistics and probability. The thing with machine learning is you deal with huge data sets and a really nice way to deal with huge data sets are matrices. That's why I've put that point in here again, matrices in ND. So we're not looking at two or three dimensional matrices. We might look at matrices that are huge, that describe like spaces of a million dimensions. There are a few different things important when you compare these type of matrices with like the typical matrices in animation or geometry. And particularly that is that these matrices are usually very sparsely populated. So you might have a matrix with like 1 million times 1 million records, but only 500 actually have a value in there and the rest is zero that kind of thing happens. And you need to find efficient ways to deal with that. Then we have algebra again. We have probability theory, because when you deal with machine learning and, and, and artificial intelligence, that usually plays a role. You know, you do experiments and you think about like, with what probability is a certain thing gonna happen? How do I express that? What are my expected values? And statistics is obviously another important thing here, particularly from a distribution and analysis point of view. The funny thing is, we have the red arrows again, right? Like algebra basics, exactly the same things that we've seen before. Probability theory that popped up before. And then matrices in N dimensions, I made it a yellow arrow because 
It is similar to what we've seen before in the other matrices um, work that we looked at briefly in other topics, but this one goes off the mainstream a little bit because it deals with slightly different things. So it's yellow, but it is still related. I picked one last example that is not directly math, but it's a bit a mix of mathematics and computer science. Um, and that is about regular expressions, you know, that every software developer loves because they are so easy and smooth to deal with. So the question mark comes up and the topics, what you want to learn or what you want to look into if you want to understand what regular expressions are, are formal languages, state machines, and set theory. So formal languages in computer science is a way to express a language, a very abstract thing. And a regular expression is nothing else. So you need to learn some basics around formal languages. And then we have state machines. State machines is another way of representing regular expressions because your flow through a regular expression is going from one state to the next one. Then we have set theory. Um, that's more math than computer science. Um, but it's quite important to know what a set is and how you deal with sets from an operational point of view, like a union and overlap and exclusion and these kind of things. And we have some element of lambda calculus around higher level logic and Turing machines that comes into play when you look at these kind of topics. Let's go back to the map of mathematics. What you can see here is a lot of the topics that we just looked at over the last, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes are very centered around the origins. You know, you see statistics and probability, and you see like algebra and matrices, geometry, calculus. Um, machine learning is a bit out here, but we also have computer science, Turing machine, and logic and set theory here, the red ones. But it's kind of interesting to see that our building blocks that we need to know about if we wanna practically use mathematics for computer science, they are not even far away from origins. You know, there's so much other stuff here that is interesting and useful, but I believe you don't need to learn a lot or relearn a lot necessarily to have a good use case and a practical use case of mathematics. So how do you get there? Obviously that can be tricky, right? Because everyone has different ways of learning. So a lot of people like video lecturers, um, like in uni or school or MOOC based, there are ways to have interactive workbooks where people build online resources you can actually interact with and play with for geometry or for, for calculus, for example. There's tons of reading material like websites and books and slide decks. And some of them are more academic and some of them are more practical and can be you know, a bit tricky sometimes to find what really works for you. And then there, obviously there are apps and other software. I personally have to say, I like video, video lectures and I like reading math books. And that is probably due to my socialization to mathematics. That's how I learned it initially. And that's you know kind of what I'm used to. But the interactive workbooks and using apps for mathematics are really cool and fun and interactive way to do these kind of things differently. You know, what basically I, didn't used to do when I go to UNO. I want to give you some good examples and useful links to follow. So for example, when it comes to lecturers and MOOCs, Khan Academy is really good. They are an open platform where kids essentially from primary school up to uni preparation can learn science. And a big focus on that is math. And they have like video, they have like practical, samples, challenges, worksheets. So you can work yourself through a whole curriculum of mathematics from year one to year 13, if you want to, or even beyond that to some extent. And it's free and it's really well done. So that would be my first recommendation. Um, then there is the Domain of Science YouTube channel from Dominic Velleman, the guy who does the who did the uh, map of mathematics, and that's really interesting as well. It focuses a little bit more on mathematics in science and practical applications, so it's probably not as good for learning fundamentals. Then there's a really good MOOC on Coursera for mathematics for machine learning. 
if you're interested in particular the math behind machine learning and AI, this is like a super good course. And similar in the direction, um, data mining with Weka. Weka is a data mining data analysis tool, open source, that's quite popular in that community. And the University of Waikato here in New Zealand, they are the main developers behind that tool. And they have built three complete online MOOC courses for data mining that are all free available under open source license Creative Commons. Interaction, my main two recommendations are the GeoGebra community and Wolfram Alpha. Um, GeoGebra is like a software that is used by a lot of teachers to provide interactive worksheets. And there is like a huge pool of resources that you can access freely and play with yourself. And Wolfram Alpha is kind of a big math kind of search calculation engine that you can use for free or paid. And the cool thing about the paid account is you get step-by-step -step solutions. So if you're actually in the process of learning things or relearning things, that can be tremendously useful. And it's not very expensive. It's like six or seven dollars um, a month. Reading, um, that can be different for different for people, what people like. I find this website here on lama.edu edu quite good, which is a collection of math tutorials on an intermediate to advanced level by one of the lecturers. So that's really nice to work through if you know already a few things and want to advance your knowledge. And then there are two books I would like to suggest. One is A Programmer's Introduction to Mathematics. That's particularly interesting if you're a software developer and you want to learn or relearn mathematics with that mindset. And the other one is a book called Elements of Mathematics from Euclid to Gödel um, from John Stilwell, which is a bit more storytelling around mathematics, but you will get a lot of things out of that as well um, to help you further your learning. And when it comes to apps and software, we have GeoGebra. I mentioned that before, an application that helps you with geometry and also some calculus and some other things. Um, then there's Octave. Octave is an open source software to do computer algebra. And it's really, really good. It's an open source clone of a software called MATLAB, if you have heard that, and it's quite compatible with MATLAB as well. Super powerful. And if you wanna do data analysis or even try to deal with big matrices with little data in it, this is a super nice tool to do that. Um, then there's tech and LaTeX, which is pretty much used to write about mathematics and take notes electronically. So it's a language to, you know, write papers and to write, you know, math worksheets. But it's a fun thing in itself to to play with that. And then there's R, which I want to, you know, mention as well. It's a very specific language to statistics and mathematics um, that you can use to analyze data and create reports based on that data. And with that, we are at the end. Um, thanks so much. I'll open the questions and open tab and quickly switch to a different screen. So you'll see me for a moment, maybe. Oh no, you don't have to. Let's go through the questions. So I'll just go from top to bottom. Uh, Ludovic asks, do you have any books or online courses to advise us to practice mathematics in specific use cases, like video games for Android, for example? Yep, so there are a few in there already. Then the second question was, I have the book, Third Math Primer for Graphics and Game Development. Do you have read it and it's a good start? I don't know the book, sorry. No idea. Um, then we have a question from Ludovic again. While you were viewing learning the Coursera course about machine learning, what was the most difficult point you needed to revise to relearn? Um, I would say the most difficult thing was to was the speed they were going through things. The math itself wasn't that complicated. The tricky element was really that 
they assumed a lot of things. It was like, oh yeah, and as you can see, we you know get this as a result. And I had to pause and I think like, how would I even possibly see that? I have no idea what's going on here. And that's more a practice thing than anything else, to be fair. That's really um, a, a getting used to doing things in mathematics again. But there was nothing particularly hard after you get used to that speed of how things are being done anymore. And then we have a question from Anonymous. Do you have nice resources in practice? For example, a list of interesting transformation matrices you found useful for animations. Um, I'm not an animator myself. So I think if you look at transformation matrices, you need to kind of find out what you want to do and what your use case is, and then look at the mathematics to achieve that. I think it's that way and not like, oh, here's a set of five or 10 cool functions to do X or to do you know, to, to use to rotate something. I would always start with, what do I want to do? And then how do I get there? Then we have a question from Anonymous. I tried to learn about topic modeling, LDA, LSA, PLSA, et cetera, but got lost in the rabbit hole of statistical concepts. Any recommendations of where to start? Um, yes and no. So there is a really good statistics MOOC on Coursera as well, which I haven't put into the links, but it was part of a seven or eight MOOC speciali specialization. I forgot what the name is, but if you ping me an email, anonymous, or send me a Twitter message to either my email address or the Twitter account that is on the slide, I will ping you back a link to that MOOC. And then the last question from Luca, lots of person on YouTube suggest to use brilliant.org. What's your opinion on it? Have you ever used it? No, I haven't, sorry, can't say anything to that. Cool, and with that, we're done with the questions. Um, thanks again for joining my talk and for coming along to this session. And I hope you got something interesting out of it. I know it's not very Android specific, but it's you know an interesting and fun and playful thing to, to do and to learn and to get into, I think. Um, so, you know, I hope you enjoyed it. And with that, I'm back to my video screen and I'll wave again into the camera. And like I said, I hope you had a lot of fun with that. Cool. Thanks all. Have a lovely day. I will go to bed soon and then watch the videos tomorrow. <laughs> bye bye.